So yeah, translations and visualizations. As um, translations, obviously, is is a is, is all about cultural diversity. It's it's about uh, global, national, local uh, diversity of languages and cultural histories. Um, I'm interested in the way that the um, the same thing can be translated in multiple different ways, which may seem a very arcane thing to be interested in, but it, um, a lot of other people are also interested in that, in, including um, uh, my collaborators, thanks for mentioning them, um, uh, computer scientists, software developers. We've been working together as a, as a small team to try and um, create new kinds of interfaces for uh, people to explore and understand uh, about why translations, how translations vary, and, and from that it's another question as to why they vary, really. Thinking of the topic of, of prosperity, a little bit of the background here, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a negative, a bit of a problem in this country. Um, in Wales it's particularly extreme, but in the UK in generally, um, young people are, are, are stopping learning languages at a very alarming rate, and so um, the country's kind of horizons of awareness of, of, the, uh, uh, of the rest of the world are, are shrinking. I could show you lots more slides which um, have similar kind of uh, downward sloping arrows for um, number of people, number of young people studying, uh, taking GCSEs or taking A-levels. There's this very alarming decline. And um, it has lots of causes, but among the causes are a kind of generalized misapprehension, misunderstanding the idea that everybody speaks English anyway. Um, I won't even waste time really um, cri uh, criticizing that. And, an and another is um, uh, the rise of, of machine translation, which is fantastic in all sorts of ways, but it does lead people to think more and more, I think, that uh, you know, if you're faced with somebody talking another language, or if you're faced with some writing in another language, or if you go abroad somewhere, you can just uh, press a button on your phone and get, get a translation. Um, it's Im important, though, to understand uh, that uh, that's, not what, um, that's not really what translation is. I'm, I t work at Swansea University. I teach uh, lecture and research mainly in German, but in a little bit of French. And I thought I'd give you a French example, because I'm guessing that nearly everybody in this room understands that and, and, and could probably translate it. Um, but uh, you've probably not really thought about the fact that you can translate it in all sorts of different ways, um, depending on the time of day, because bonjour could be translated as good morning or good afternoon. It depends. And so your machine translation machine is, is well, I suppose it could it might be able to tackle that. Um, or you can, you can say, I'm called Ted, I'm Ted, Ted's my name, the name's Ted. With these slightly different, nuanced, different formulations, you're expressing a different personality. There are different degrees of formality and informality, um, politeness, or... or, or um, so, <coughs> translation is an art. It's a craft and it's an art um, in which if you want to do translation properly, you need to think, not, you're not translating words, you're translating a culture and you're translating a particular context. And there are lots of things that need thinking about, and this is what makes it interesting and fun. Hello, I'm Ted is a simple example. When you get into the questions about translating poetry, it gets um, much more, uh, the options become much, much greater. I'm going to talk you through briefly through this example, but not everybody in the room will um, well, no Shakespeare's Othello, and some of you who do may not quite remember the story. These lines are famous, even notorious lines, um, uh, very controversial lines. Uh, the Duke of Venice says, if virtue no delighted beauty lack, and many of you will think, typical Shakespeare, what the hell does that mean? It's uh, very um, convoluted and, and difficult. And then the second line, your son-in-law is far more fair than... Black. So, a quick reminder: the um, uh, this is the play where the, the hero Othello is the commander in chief of the uh, military forces of the Republic of Venice. He's one of the most powerful and important men in the state. There he is, being played by Paul Robeson back in the 1950s. And uh, near at the beginning of the right at the beginning of the play, we discover the audience learns that um, he has just married the beautiful. Desdemona, who, of course, is white. Everybody is white in the play apart from, from Othello. Everybody in Venice is white apart from Othello. He's married Desdemona. 
but without seeking in advance the permission of her father. And her father is enraged and appalled that she has gone and got married, A, without his position, permission, and B, to a black man. And he says some appalling things about Othello. He goes to the Duke of Venice, the ruler of the state, and uh, demands that something be done about this. And the Duke of Venice hears what Othello has to say and what Desdemona has to say. And he dismisses the father's complaint with these words, the last words in, uh, in the scene, if virtue no delighted beauty lack. In other words, if virtue is beautiful, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. <coughs> Words with which he is praising Othello, saying he's virtuous and beautiful, delightful, fair, but he's also denigrating Othello's race. He's deploying the stereotype of black equals bad, white equals good. And these are lines that some productions cut because they're so offensively racist. The father is clearly racist. Whether the Duke intends to be racist here is not quite clear because these lines can be played as a joke. Such it's, it's complex. Part of the complexity lies in the puns. Shakespeare's notorious for his puns. Um, and several, many of the words in those two lines can be treated as, can be understood in various different ways. Um, so fair can be understood as a, as a color term, as a moral term, as an aesthetic term, or as a kind of spiritual term. Uh, fair as advantageous. <coughs> and so you can begin to see, I expect, how if you had to translate these lines into another language, you don't translate word for word. You can up to a point, but really you need to translate an interpretation of these lines. Who is this Duke? What is he trying to say? How is he trying to use language? You have to create a new Duke in your other language. It's complicated. Um, a few years ago, I got interested in this. I got interested in this because I was working on the German translations, of which there are 50 or 60 different German translations over the past 250 years. And I discovered that these two lines are like a kind of litmus test. If you follow the different translations, you can see how they reflect changing ideas about race, about gender, about power. They're translated in different ways. And then I started collecting them internationally by uh, creating a Google site. And then if there's anybody in the audience who happens to know any translations of Othello in any world languages, please get in touch. Um, so here's a selection of translations contributed by people all over the world. And I'll show you a French example, just a couple of quick examples the way that translators can deal creatively with these lines in unexpected sort of ways. So back in 1830, French translator De Vigny translates you know, just the second line, virtue can rule under a black banner. He's kind of refusing the stereotype. He's refusing the contrast. He doesn't use the contrast between black and white or black and fair. He just says virtue and black, no contrast. And then Hans Rorte is a very interesting story. This is a translator who was very famous in the 1920s and 30s in Germany for his uh, kind of modern versions of Shakespeare, very, very popular, very successful, um, <clears throat> and was uh, sent into exile by the, by the Nazis who denounced his work as being liberal and cosmopolitan. And he uh, translated the complete works of Shakespeare and it was only in 1956, when he'd come back to Germany after the war, he translated Othello and his lines there. I'll just read them in, in, in English. If what counted with people was only their inner appearance, we would be darker than Othello. Now, that's borderline not even a translation of, of Shakespeare. He's saying something about we, us, in this case, I think, the Germans, after the war and after the Holocaust. So the history of these lines, the history of versions of these lines is really fascinating. I started working with, I had this collection of 40 or 50 German translations of Shakespeare, and I started working with uh, <coughs> software developers to try and find ways to enable people to explore those translations. 
whether or not they could read German, ideally. And <coughs> here's one of the things that we did, which is a, it's online, it's interactive time map. You can scale and zoom and so forth. And it just simply shows you where and when the different translations appeared um, or were written. So over here, you can see a couple of them written in London by exiles uh, during the Second World War. Um, <coughs> This is already well, but this just shows what we call metadata, the when and the where, the, maybe the titles, information about the texts, not the actual texts. So the next thing was to try and find ways of actually working with the texts themselves. So we had to digitize all these texts and align every speech with every other speech, every speech in the original with every speech in every translation. And this is a map produced by a computer of this side is the English text and this side is the, uh, the German text. And each little horizontal line here is a speech in the play. Uh, actually, it's in one scene here. And the red one is the longest speech in the scene. And <clears throat> you do this with lots of them. You start to be able to compare the way that translators have added, omitted, moved things around, uh, et cetera. You're still at a kind of distance from the text, but we're beginning to see kind of here there's a historical layout. And you can see how all the most recent translations, these are all from the 21st century, and people are no longer translating the whole play. They're just selecting bits from it. And this is another kind of a map of the collection of translations of Othello in German. It looks a bit like a brain, Othello's brain map. Um, stylometry is a computerized method of counting words and then comparing the frequency of words in texts. And this is a new kind of method here of using a computer to do that really, really fast on an enormous scale. All the most frequent words in a text are words in English, like the and a and of and and, and, and words that don't really have very much meaning. And in every <coughs> different text can be compared for the frequencies of those kind of words. And that separates out author, individual author styles, or it separates out periods, or it separates out genres. So the colored groups over here, this is all the 21st century texts. These are very, very different kind of adaptations of Othello in some ways, but they're all using the German language in a similar kind of a way. Um, over there on the right, all the early 19th century ones. Once in the middle, that's the mid to late 19th century. <coughs> Down here, early 18th century and late 20th century. What they have in common is that they're all in prose. All the other translations are in verse. They're designed to be like poetry. These are, these are ones produced for um, sort of study purposes. From the late, 17th, late 18th century to the late 20th century, they're the same. So what this is telling us is that this is not showing the map of the evolution of the German language, because that stayed the same down there in the right-hand corner. It's the st style of theatrical language in particular. Down here is Hans Rauter, the German translator I mentioned. And what's quite remarkable about that is his translation from 1956 is in a group with ones from the 1990s and 1970s. Others from the 1950s are, are way away, completely dissimilar. <coughs> Reuter, this is telling us, was about 40 years ahead of his time in the style of German that he was using. We built a, well, the, pro, the software developers built Interfaces which enable you to explore the two texts, zipping up and down. This is a very uh, dynamic, interactive interface. And probably the most original thing that we did is this interface. Again, it's kind of very mobile and interactive and fun to, fun to play with. Over on the left-hand side, you've got the English text. And it's divided up into segments. And if you click on any of these segments, you get the translation pops up over there, all the different translations. And, but the cool thing is how you can arrange those different translations. You can order them in different ways, in order of date or in order of the name of the translator. But you can also order them in, in order of predictability. So if you get 
20, 40 translations of the same thing, say 20 of them will be uh, quite predictable. They'll be roughly similar. Others will be more different. And <coughs> the computer uses counts of words, word frequencies, comparing all the different versions in order to arrange all the different translations in the order of how predictable they are, so that you can scroll down this list on the right there from the kind of standard, not very interesting translations to the really, really interesting translations, the really unusual, wild, crazy ones. So this is all done by the computer, and it's done by an algorithm which attaches numerical values. So you have all the translations over there have a set of different numerical values, and you can plot those numerical values back over onto the English text. So the blue colors, which you must have noticed, the darker the blue color, the more variation in the translations. So we've invented a way of reading Shakespeare through the translations. You don't even need to understand the translations to be able to see. As you read through, where it's darker blue, it means the translators have varied from one another more. And that opens up a whole lot of really interesting questions about, is that because of something to do with Shakespeare's text? That was the initial assumption, actually. The initial hypothesis was that we were going to identify the difficult bits in Shakespeare by using the translations. Um, and we found that's true up to a point, but we're also finding out lots of unexpected things about how translators behave, where translators put in the effort to be different from other translators, which is an important part of what translators do. So the idea, the general idea, is to uh, <coughs> develop this kind of technology, this kind of applications of technology um, for research purposes. Where, where people all over the world are now using this technology for looking into different kinds of uh, text, literary text, uh, scripture, and all sorts of um, texts that have been multiply translated. Um, we're also looking to develop applications for it in teaching, um, for translation competitions, and that kind of thing. And above all, hopefully, to make people more enthusiastic and interested and curious about language, about languages, about uh, the challenge of translation, because uh, it's important for diversity, uh, diversity that goes beyond what we can see when we look at other people. What's inside their heads um, has a lot to do with the languages that they know or don't. My collaborators out there, thank you all very much. <laughs>